And this sermon is brought to you by Christ Church South Philadelphia, a church that is committed to living out the gospel in their neighborhood and from there impacting the world. For more information about our church or to support our mission, you can go to www.christchurchsouthphilly.org. You kind of make your way to Luke chapter 19, verse 11. Um, I wonder how many people here are like me in that you hate waiting. Does anyone else here hate, hate waiting as much as I do? I absolutely hate waiting. If you're watching us on a live stream, you can give me a raise your hand, give me a witness as well. I can't see you, but praise God for your participation. Um, I hate waiting. I, I would rather drive 30 minutes out of my way than stay stuck in traffic for five. I would. It just feels better to be moving. A, f- a few years ago, someone blessed us with a uh, trip to Disney World, happiest place on earth, right? And it was great. It was a glorious time. But if you do not like waiting, going to Disney World with a five-year-old daughter is going to, um, how do I say this? It's going to be a personal character development moment. Um, because here, here's how our days would go. There'd be all these cool rides that, you know, man, I, I'd never been to Disney World before. I'm like, yeah, let's go here. Let's see this. And then, um, you know, my daughter would be like, okay, yeah, but first, can we go talk to this princess? And, and next thing I know, instead of being on the ride, I'm waiting in a line to meet a, some fictional character played by, you know, some random person. And these are not short lines. No, no, no. Th- these are lines that go on for 30 minutes, 60 minutes. We were in one for over an hour. And so I'm standing in line, and an hour later, like, my daughter, she's getting her, you know, selfie with Cinderella. And I'm, like, developing a nervous tick because, like, I just, you know, I can't. I just, I hate waiting. I hate waiting. But today, Jesus is going to talk to us about waiting. He's going to talk to us about waiting. More specifically, he's going to talk to us about what we should do while we wait for his return. See, unlike me just standing in line doing nothing, Jesus wants us to understand that waiting for his return is not about killing time, but rather there is something significant that he has called each one of us to do with the time that we have been given. Each one of us, there's a purpose that Jesus has for you. And so I'm going to tell this morning's sermon, Living with Significance. Living with Significance. Which is something that we can all do if we apply what we hear today. Reading in Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 27. This is the Word of God. As he heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable. Because he was near to Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minias and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him saying, Lord, your minya has made ten minyas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant. Because you've been faithful in very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Lord, your minya has made five minyas. And he said to him, and you over five cities. Then other came saying, Lord, here's your minya, which I've kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And on my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the minion from him and give it to the one who has ten minions. He said, Lord, he has ten minions. And I, I tell you, to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Praise God for his word. May be with us now through the preaching of his word. 
The setting here is that Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, and the place where it had been prophesied that the Messiah would come and bring God's kingdom. Jesus has been on a purposeful journey to Jerusalem that started all the way back in chapter 9 of Luke. And now as he drew near to the city, his new his disciples were getting pretty excited because they thought this kingdom of God they've been waiting for was going to immediately, it says in verse 12, 11, was immediately going to appear. But Jesus knew that that was not going to be the case. Jesus knew they were going to have to wait. There was a time coming when the Messiah would appear and would go to Jerusalem and would set up God's kingdom once and for all and vanquish all of God's king- enemies. But on this trip to Jerusalem, Jesus the Messiah was not coming to be crowned king. He was coming to be the suffering servant. Jesus was going to Jerusalem not to receive his coronation. He was going to Jerusalem to die on the cross for our sins. To be raised again to new life. To go to heaven to prepare a place for us. And then he'd come back and establish God's kingdom once and for all. And so Jesus knew that he was not going to set up this kingdom immediately that the disciples expected, he knew they were going to have to wait. And so he tells the story of a king who goes away, and then he says the different responses that servants gave as they waited for his return. And in doing this, he is setting up for us what we are to do as we wait for our king to return. He tells a similar story in Matthew chapter 25. But Matthew 20, uh, chapter 25, there are some key differences that are really important to notice. First, in Matthew chapter 25, the servants are each given different amounts. One gets five, one gets three, one gets one. And the amounts of money that they're given, it's the, the word that's used is talents. It's actually where we get our word talented. The, the point of the story in Matthew is that God has each, given each one of us different talents, and we are to use these different talents to serve God, not be envious of the talents that other people have, but rather use the unique talents that God has given to us and fully maximize those talents to serve Him. That's a great message. That's not this message. This message is a different teaching. Because notice in verse 13 that we have ten servants, and it each says they're giving ten minyas. Now, I'm not great at math, but I'm pretty sure ten divided by ten is one. And so they all are given what? They're all given one of the same thing. Each one has one minya. They get different outcomes with what they've been given, but the story is stressing to us that they've all been given the same amount of the same thing. And so the key to interpreting this text is knowing what does Jesus want us to do while we wait by asking this question. What is it that Jesus has given his servants in equal ways? If we want to know what Jesus wants us to be about, the business he's given us as we wait for his return, the question we should ask ourselves is, what is it that Jesus has given each one of us equally the same? Here's how the New Testament authors, the people who wrote the parts of the Bible that came after this, here's how they talk about what God has entrusted us with as his servants as we wait for his return. Here's what we all have equal access to. 1 Thessalonians 2.4, we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. See friends, we are different people with different abilities, different talents, but we all have been entrusted With the same gospel. Gospel means good news. See, the Bible is very clear that we are sinful people who deserve God's judgment for using the life that he gave us to live for him, using that life to instead live by our own rules, live our own way. But the good news, the gospel, is that through Jesus, we can be reconciled, we can be made right with God. Because Jesus came, and because he has lived the perfect life that we fail to live. Because Jesus came, 
And he has died the death that we deserve to die on the cross as God's punishment for our sins. Because Jesus has risen to new life, proving that his sacrifice on the cross is and always will be an acceptable atonement for our sin to God. And because he has gone to heaven to prepare a place for us, and because he's coming back to welcome us home forever, because Jesus has lived, because Jesus has died, because Jesus has risen, and because Jesus is coming again, Jesus has accomplished salvation for anyone who would put their faith in him. See, through faith in Jesus, what he accomplished gets applied to us. His perfect life covers over our sinful life. His death gets applied against our debt of death. His resurrected and ascended life assures us that we too will rise to eternal life in heaven with him forever. Friends, this is the good news. We were sinners who have been made right by Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. And it is the same gospel for each one of us. It's the same gospel for each one of us. There's no different gospels. There's only one gospel. There's only one good news. One of the greatest preachers of all time, Charles Spurgeon, he tells this story. He says, I near the chapel, I perceived that someone was in the pulpit preaching. And who should the preacher be but my dear and venerable grandfather. He saw me as I came in the, the front door and made my way up the aisle, and at once he said, here comes my grandson. He may preach the gospel better than I can, but he cannot preach a better gospel. Can you, Charles? Friends, he can't preach a better gospel because there is no better gospel. There is only one gospel. We've all been entrusted with the same gospel, the gospel of the disciples. The gospel of the apostles, the gospel of the reformers, the gospel of every Christian throughout all of history. Friends, this is our gospel. We've all been entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we're to be about the business of multiplying it. See, the unfaithful servant is the one who did nothing to multiply what he had been given by the king. The faithful servants were those who took what was given and increased it. And so there's nothing we can do to increase what Jesus has done. But as we share about what Jesus has done, and more people come to rejoice in that good news, we what? We increase the praise of our King. As we believe in the gospel, God does not want us to keep that belief to ourselves. He doesn't want us just to enjoy it for ourselves. No, He has entrusted us with the gospel so that its truth can be multiplied in other people's lives as we share with them this Glorious good news. Jesus is telling us a story because he wants us to live by this truth. You want to live with significance? Well, here's what living with significance is according to Jesus. Living with significance comes through living to share the significance of the gospel. Living with significance comes through living to share the significance of the gospel. Friends, this parable is giving each one of us a life calling. It doesn't matter what roles you have in life, and it doesn't matter what vocations you have in life. We all have the same calling in life. It doesn't matter if you're a doctor, it doesn't matter if you're an engineer, it doesn't matter if you're a student, it doesn't matter if you're a chef, it doesn't matter if you're an accountant, it doesn't matter if you're a teacher, maybe a delivery truck driver, a warehouse worker, it doesn't matter if you're a stay-at-home parent. It doesn't matter if you are a semi-retired grandparent. It doesn't matter what your current vocation is or what your current role is. This parable wants to tell you that those things, they're not your calling. Those things are simply platforms God has given you to work out your calling. You, you might do something incredible that you absolutely love. I, I hope so. It's a blessing to enjoy what we do. But no matter what we do, whether we feel like it's something really important, where I feel like it's something like, ah, you know, no one would probably miss this if I stopped doing this. We all have been given a calling that is incredibly significant. We've all been given a calling to live with significance through living to share the significance of the gospel. And everything else we do in life is meant to be a platform for us to live out that calling. After the Eagles won the Super Bowl, we have to remind ourselves that that did happen. It's been a rough season. Um, after the Eagles won the Super Bowl, Super Bowl MVP quarterback Nick Foles said this, football is not my purpose. 
It is my platform to share the gospel. Zach Ertz, the tight end who had caught a key touchdown in that uh, game that really went a long way to securing their victory. Here's what he said. He said, the most important thing I did today was talk about Jesus. I love, I love that. I love that. See, they had achieved the height of success, but they did not see doing that as their purpose. They just saw that as a means to a greater end. And so listen, friends, work hard at your job, or be a really good student, or pursue being as faithful a parent as you possibly can be. Pursue those things, but not just to achieve success by the world's standards, no, pursue those things to have opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, there's all kinds of different things we can do in life, but there's one calling that we have, which is to multiply the gospel we've been entrusted with through sharing the gospel with others. Living with significance comes through living to share the significance of the gospel. Now, as I say that, here's, here's how this text kind of hits me. We're a church where pastors are vulnerable, so I hope that's okay with you. Here's, here's, how this, here's how this hits me. I immediately go to all the ways that I don't live up to this. I immediately go to all the ways that I blow it, all the times I don't bear witness, all the times I fall silent, or all the times, I'll be honest with you, I just don't care enough to share. But I think as we look at, into this a little bit deeper, and as we see the examples of the faithful servants, and we see what's going on with the unfaithful servant, I think we're actually given some divine help to walk out this sacred calling. So let's look together two things this morning. Let's look at the profile of the unfaithful servant. And let's look at the principle of the faithful servants. The profile of the unfaithful servant and the principle for faithful servants. This is the profile of the unfaithful servant. We're told in verse 21, we're told the reason by his own lips why he did not invest what he had been given. This is what he says in verse 21. He says, I was afraid of you because you're a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. See, he thought his master was a greedy person. He thought his master was an unfair person. And so because of that, he felt fear of his master. And it was his fear that kept him from being faithful to walk out this calling. This, this unfaithful servant listened to his feelings and made choices based upon those feelings, choices that actually, if you think about it, don't even make much sense. The master points out the fa this fact that his, his choices make very little sense. He says in verse 22, I'll condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew thou was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And on my coming, I might have collected it with interest. Do you see what he's saying? He's like, hey, if you're really afraid of me, then, then why didn't your fear prompt you to do something for me? If you, if you were scared I was going to, you know, come down hard on you, then why did you just hide this stuff I've been giving you? See, the reality is, this unfaithful servant was afraid, and his fear was keeping him from even thinking clearly. It's one thing that fear can be, right? It can be irrational, can't it? And it was his feelings of fear that didn't even make sense, but these feelings of fear are what kept him from being faithful to fulfill his calling. As I read that, I immediately see myself. I immediately see myself. Do, do you see yourself? How easy is it to allow fear to keep us back from sharing our faith? We can fear, what will this person think of me? We can fear, will I, will I know what to say? When I was in business, it was fear of not wanting to hinder my career. It was fear of not wanting to upset my coworkers. It was fear of not wanting to lose a client. Now with my neighbors, it can be fear of not wanting to be weird, not wanting to be that guy. I think as a pastor, you kind of like forever sign up to be that guy. But like, like even though I don't want to be that guy, I don't want to be the guy who has to like bring up religious things. Our feelings of fear can hold us back all the time, can't they? And then we get caught in this cycle. I think of this like this, this fear cycle. We fear, we, we fear sharing, and so then we don't share, 
And then because we don't share, we feel guilty about not sharing. And then here's what happens the next time we have an opportunity to share our faith. Not only do we fear sharing, but now we also fear blowing it again and feeling guilty again. And so because we fear two different things, the fear is compounded in our lives and we're even more locked up. And so we blow it again. And then because we blow it again, we feel even more guilty again. And so the next time something comes, it becomes even harder. Fear compounds. We get caught in this cycle of fear. But here's the thing. When we think about our feelings of fear, here's the question we have to ask ourselves. Just because we feel something, does that mean that that feeling is, that, that, uh, that that's actually true? Are our feelings based on what is always true? They're not, are they? Last summer, I heard gunshots around the corner as I was walking home, and I felt afraid. I went and hid behind a car. That's a very rational fear. There's been shootings in our neighborhood, so it was right for me to do that. But then, about a week or so ago, I had a dream. I had a dream that my wife, Angie, had been abducted. And I woke up in the middle of the night feeling very afraid. Now, did I have any reason to be afraid? No, I didn't. And so I was feeling something, but what I was feeling was not actually true. And so our culture wants to tell us, hey, listen, live what you feel. If you feel something, live that truth. Friends, that is terrible advice. Terrible advice. Because your feelings might actually not be true or not. Or not. Like, it'd be terrible advice for me to be like, hey, listen, I'm going to live my truth. I woke up thinking my wife's, you know, abducted. Even though I can feel her right here, and even though I see her right here, I'm going to live my truth. I'm going to live my feelings. I'm going to act like I have no more wife. Like, you'd be like, uh, you know, someone get this guy a psychiatrist, right? Like, that's insanity. But that's the insanity of our culture. Live what you feel. Friends, we shouldn't want to live what we feel. We should want to live what is true. When I was feeling afraid that Angie was gone, what I needed was to be reminded of what was actually true. She was right there next to me. But notice in that illustration, notice how my feelings changed. My feelings didn't change because I sat in bed feeling afraid, and I'm like, listen, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, have courage, have courage, just more willpower, more willpower, more, and I'm trying to willpower my feelings to change. That's not how my feelings change. Why they change? Because my knowledge changed. I didn't try to change my feelings. What I needed was to experience different knowledge. See, I think a lot of times we get really caught up when we think about sharing our faith because we feel like some mystical idea that at some point we'll no longer feel afraid. At some point, we'll just be able to have enough willpower in ourselves to no longer feel afraid when it comes to sharing our faith. And so we try to change ourselves on a feelings level. But friends, let's just be really clear. Trying to change your feelings is a surefire way to continue to experience feeling defeated. Because you can't change your feelings. You can't just, you can't just willpower your feelings to change. What you need to change, you need to change your truth. You need to change the source of where those feelings are coming from. See, what Jesus is telling us here is that our feelings of fear, they're a symptom of an underlying cause. This guy felt afraid. Why? Because he was believing something wrong about the master. And so what he needed was not to be told, don't be afraid. What he needed was to be told who the master is. See, fear comes from not just what we're experiencing. Fear comes from what we are believing, what we are believing about God. As we go to share our faith, friends, let's be really clear. We might be feeling fear, but it's not fear that's holding us back, actually. It's our theology. It's what we're believing about God in that moment. That kind of gives us a diagnostic of what's going inside of ourselves. Here's, here's the prescription. Here's what we do with that. Let's look at the principle for faithfulness, the principle for faithfulness. The faithful servants, that they went to work. They went about the master's business, and they, did, they got what? They, they, were given, they were given a reward. They were given a reward because unlike what the unfaithful servant felt, these faithful servants knew that their master was generous. And if we think about the story, we should see the generosity of this master all over it. First, he calls these servants and gives them freely different, uh, money. There was nothing that, that, in this text, that tells us that he was compelled to do that. Nothing that these servants did that earned that from him. He simply chose, out of the generosity of his heart, 
to give them this gift. And then not only that, but when they take that gift that, that the master had given, when they take it and multiply it, they get rewarded for it. And not just a little bit rewarded. Like, did you see what they got? Like, the guy takes his one minion, turns it into ten, and he's then given ten cities. Okay, let, let me just bring this into contemporary examples to understand what's going on. A minya was about three months working wage or so. So let's say, rough numbers, about $10,000. So this one servant, he, you know, he takes his 10000 and he makes 100000 Pretty good investor. It's a pretty good investment. He brings this $100,000 to the king, and here's what the king does. He says, okay, I'm going to take that hundred grand, and I'm going to give you authority over New York and Philadelphia and Los Angeles and San Francisco and San Diego and Phoenix and Boston and Denver and Seattle and Portland. Like, he gives him the rule to cities for a mere $100,000. Friends, what we're supposed to see here is that the reward is ridiculously disproportional to the actual work that was done. But that's what a generous master does. This is a generous, this is a generous master. Friends, in God, we have a very generous, we have a very generous master. I mean, think about it. He has called us to Himself through no merit of our own. There's nothing that we have done to compel God to want to give us the gift of the gospel, and yet that is what He's done. He's called us to Himself to believe that. He has given us forgiveness of our sins. He has given us adoption into His uh, his family. He has given us welcome into heaven forever. And then when we get into heaven, only because of Him, when we get into heaven, we are rewarded for the things that we do that we're actually empowered by Him. Friends, we have a ridiculously generous God. We have a ridiculously generous God. We are made His servants, sheerly by His grace. And then, as we live life faithfully as His servants, He rewards us, which is also expression of His grace. We get into heaven because of Him, and then when we get to heaven... What we get is given to us by Him because He is a generous, a generous God. And think about it. These servants, they were able to multiply what? They were to multiply what they had first been given. And so the only reason they were able to do anything for the king was because the king had first been generous to them. And so they really couldn't boast in anything in and of themselves All they were doing was what they had been positioned to do by the king. And yet, the king still rewarded them. Friends, our God is a generous God. Not only has he called us in the gospel, but then he has positioned us. And he works through us to be faithful to him. And then we get rewarded by him for what he empowered us to do. Friends, our God's a generous God. Our God's a generous God. And our feelings of fear can be changed into power to be faithful as we realize how generous this God is. Our feelings of fear can be changed into power to be faithful when we realize how generous our God is in the gospel. In the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me say it this way. As we think about the gospel, it is thinking about the gospel that should empower us to share the gospel. It is the gospel and meditating on it and thinking about it and growing in our understanding of it. It is the gospel that empowers us to share the gospel. That's the faithfulness principle. You want to grow and be more faithful? You want to be more faithful to use your life this year in 2021 to live with significance and to, to share the gospel more? Don't try to change your feelings. No, allow God to change your heart by meditating more and more on the good news of what Jesus has done for you. Allow the gospel to be what empowers you to share the gospel. See, when we're fearful, we shouldn't try to have more willpower. What we need is to be reminded of how the gospel speaks directly into that fear. And so when, you know, I'm fearful that sharing the gospel won't have any effect, I need to be reminded of the power of the gospel and how it has affected me. 
when I'm fearful that I'm not going to know what to say. I need to be reminded that it's not the power of my words that converts anyone. It's the power of the gospel that saves. When I'm worried that I'm not going to have all the right answers. I need to be reminded that my hope is not in knowing everything, but in knowing the gospel that Jesus said is simple enough to be comprehended by children. When I'm aware that I've blown it, and I feel like I didn't share faithfully, and I can feel the guilt of that, I need to be reminded that I can get back up, and I can try again, because my life in Christ is not about what I do for Him, but what He has done for me. I need to be reminded of the gospel. See, friends, living with significance, it comes through living to share the significance of the gospel, and we are empowered to live out that calling through the gospel. Through being assured of the generosity of God and who He is and the good news of Jesus, that is what positions us to be faithful to live out this calling He's given us. Or if I could say it this way, all we have is from God, all we do is through God, and so all we do is to the praise of God. Or even more specifically, all we have is from Jesus, all we do is through Jesus, therefore all we do is for the praise of Jesus. From Him and by Him and to Him are all things. Now friends, as we kind of come to a close here, part of me would just love to end the sermon there. Praise Jesus. Cue the music. But that's not where Jesus actually ends this parable. He doesn't just speak about these servants. He moves on to speak about the citizens. Notice two distinct categories here. You have the servants who are His servants. And even the servant who is unfaithful the reward gets taken away, but he's still a servant. We can get to heaven through faith and faith alone, but if you get to heaven only having faith and not having done something for the Lord, then all, that's all you'll get when you get to heaven. There, there will be no rewards. We can get to heaven without rewards, but we still get there, praise God, because it's only because of Jesus. We can still be a servant even if we're unfaithful, but there's another category here. Jesus moves from talking about the servants to talking about the citizens. This is what he says in verse 27 about these citizens. He says, as for these, drawing our attention, these other people, as for these enemies of mine who do not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. See, those who are opposed to the king end up being opposed by the king. And that's never a good thing. And I know that our American sensibilities are just firing off right now. This is so judgmental. This is so narrow-minded. And I just want to be clear. Like, personally, you know, I don't mean to be judgmental at all. I don't judge anyone for any of their sin. Because the gospel tells me I'm a sinner. I'm not better than anyone. My only hope for salvation is Jesus Christ. And so, personally, I don't, I don't judge anyone. But what Jesus is telling us here is that God will judge. God will judge people who don't turn to Him for salvation. You see, in heaven, there can only be one king. And so to reject God in this life means that when we get to eternal life, we will be given the opportunity to do that for all eternity. We'll be given our heart's desire. We don't want to have God rule over on us on earth, then in eternity God will say, fine, I'm not ruling over you. Depart from me. And guess what? When you are sent away from the presence of God, you're being sent away from the source of life. That's why eternal life is contrasted with eternal death. Being separate from God is soul slaughter. As we say that, I know it can be really harsh and can sound really hard, but here's what we have to understand. It's biblical. I can't change what the Bible says. I just have to show it to you faithfully. And friends, here's what we also have to understand. We, we get concerned when we read warnings like this, but here's what we have to understand. God's warnings are not meant to scare us. God's warnings are an expression of His love for us. It's a sick person who sees a bridge out sign and takes down that sign of warning so that they can sit there and watch car after car full of people drive to their death. God is unwilling to take down the signs of warning. He is unwilling to let anyone drive by in life 
without being warned of the destruction that is to come if you reject him. So we say, how, how could a loving God allow us to exist? Friends, how could a loving God not, allow us, not warn us? God is love. God is love. He's made a different way, and he's, he's made it clear what that way is. And he's called us to believe in him because he is not willing to let any of us walk by. And so if you're watching this either here in person or watching this online or maybe watching this later, I mean, anyone right now under the sound of my voice, God has you watching this. Because he doesn't want you to drive by. He wants you to know him. The good news of Jesus can be your good news of salvation if you put your faith in him today. Friends, the gospel has significance. It has significance for eternal life or eternal death. Today, God is putting before you life and death. I pray that you, which put your faith in Christ, and that you would choose life. With that in mind, I just want to lead us now in praying that God would position our hearts to know how we should respond to this word that we've just heard preached. Let's bow our heads in prayer.